Hi, this is Daniel and you're watching Unrivaled Investing. Another day, another SPAC, another company trying to disrupt a legacy field. Today we're going to talk about IPOB, which is merging with Open Door. Why did this get my interest? A couple points. Chamath Palahapatiya, a new SPAC, and it's fast growing. So what are we going to discuss in this video? First, what is IPOB? What is Open Door? A little bit of background on it. What's their business? What's the opportunity? Do they have an unrivaled value proposition? And my thoughts on, on, on valuation. You know, does this have 10x potential, not only from a business perspective, but for shareholders? And if you watch until the end, there's a free investment calculator for you to play around with what you think shareholders can do in the future. But before digging in, if you enjoy hearing about companies that could potentially go up hundreds or even thousands of percent over time, hit subscribe. And if you're already a subscriber, hit that like button. And if you want to know what I'm personally buying, selling, holding, and why in any given month, plus exclusive content and exclusive videos, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on that journey button. Feel free to leave a note below this video about any companies that you think are interesting that you want me to look into. So what is IPOB? IPOB is a SPAC, technically it's Social Capital, Hiro Sophia Holdings Corporation 2. IPOB is much easier to say. Um, quick overview of what are SPACs, because it's good just to have a general understanding. SPACs are special purpose acquisition companies or corporations. They hold a pile of cash. And their goal, end all be all, is to merge with a company, buy X percent of a company, and go public and, and have that company effectively go public through their vehicle. Now, the reason why they're all the rage right now is because interest rates are so low and investors don't really have a lot of opportunities to make a lot of money. So if you're an investor in a SPAC, SPACs generally price at $10 a share. If you reject the deal, so you, you reject with whatever company that they're going to merge with, you can generally get your cash back minus a couple of percent. So downside, a couple of percent. If the deal is wildly you know, anticipated, investors love it, the, the IPOB or the SPAC could go to the moon. And that's what you've seen here with IPOB. The stock has gone from $10 to 17. And so you get all this upside potential and relatively downside, relatively limited downside. So it's an attractive risk reward, especially in a low interest rate environment. So that's the reason why SPACs are all the rage. What's the, the pros and cons of it? First of all, it makes it much easier for companies to go public and it's easier for them to get that capital. You don't have to go through the song and dance of going through an IPO roadshow where there are multiple gatekeepers along the way in terms of getting those funds. Um, but the companies are sort of limp capping their upside because they don't, if they're doing a direct issuance, they don't get that upside if the market goes higher over time as they sell, sell stock. They are locking in a deal with Chamath at $10 a share and saying, this is, this is what we're structuring at. So even though the deal is effectively priced, even though the share price is now 17, Open Door doesn't see any of that benefit. Um, the cons are generally for SPACs, and this is no comment on IPOB or Chamath Palapatia, is that it does, SPACs do make it easier for crappier companies or you can think of worse, worse words to become public. Because at the end of the day, if you have a $100 million SPAC, that's effectively one gatekeeper, one person with funds that they can just buy one company. There's not a lot of steps along the way that's preventing them from buying what is a lousy company and bringing them to the public. Um, so whenever you're looking at any SPAC, you need to size up one, who's the investor? You know, Is this a good person to partner with? Is this a good team to partner with? And two, what's the underlying company that they're merging with? So who is Chamath Palahapatiya? And so his background is that at age six, he and his family moved to Sri Lanka. He was a refugee, um, moved from Sri Lanka to Canada, um, where he grew up on welfare, you know, dirt poor. So when I, I, I'm only sharing this data point because I, you know, I want to know the, the psychology of anyone that I'm going to be partnering with. And when I hear that sort of background, like refugee growing up on welfare, I know this guy's going to have like a killer instinct fighting, you know, strong desire to fight and survive. I mean, that's, that's what's the, those are the, it seems probable that those would be the instincts, you know, if, or odds. That's what that, that's how it'll shake out for him. And, and so far that certainly seems the case becoming a derivative trader. I mean, that is, 
that is probably one of the toughest fields in finance derivative trading. It also, it's super complex and hard. Then he ran AOL's instant message messaging division in 2004. Then he joined Facebook around their, their one year anniversary and helped oversee its growth, which everyone knows was incredibly fast. So Chamath Palahapatiya, he's relatively young in his forties and he's hungry. And that's where he's been. But what about his track record allocating capital? And the, the answer is it's fantastic. You know, you can see that he's made several very public calls that have done really well. Bitcoin 2012, Amazon 2015, Tesla 2016, Virgin Galactic in 2019. If you had just mimicked uh, those calls, you would have done really well well over time. And using the proceeds of his very successful bets and endeavors, he's registered IPO A through Z as a way of saying, look, I'm going to revolutionize bringing companies public through SPACs, which is more cost efficient, is easier than doing IPOs. And he's going to try to find these companies that ideally should be coming public faster, but just haven't. And Open Door is an example of that. So what is IPO B? It is a SPAC um, and it's merging with Open Door the SPAC plus a private placement is raising near a, a little over $1 billion, where nearly all the proceeds are going to Open Door, uh, Open Door's balance sheet. That's not always the case. There are some SPACs, and I've done a couple of videos on a, on a few SPACs, where the proceeds you know, go to pay out, you know, pay out uh, existing shareholders. So it's, it's nice to see billion dollars going to Open Door, about 3% going to you know deal costs. This is relative to an IPO where the deal cost could be five to six percent. So it's certainly more efficient. Um, do they need it? That's a question that we'll be you know asking ourselves as uh, as we go through this video. You know, does Open Door need another extra billion dollars on their balance sheet? Um, so what is Open Door? Open Door is trying to use their technology and know-how of real estate to buy homes from sellers. They're trying to automate the ability to buy homes online. To make it so much easier if you're a seller to go sell your home. Um, is this part of a broader trend? And the answer is yes. I mean, you can see this with cars, clothes, groceries, food, even luxury goods. Um, really anything and everything is moving online. So why not houses? Why can't you sell a house just as easily as you can sell a used book? So the value proposition for Open Door is that you have this one counterparty that you're working with. And you can you can pick the timeline for when you want to sell this. So you don't you know you don't have you know a double mortgage or a double rent problem. Like if you're selling this house and you're buying another, um, or you're going to go rent someplace else, you know you 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 don't you don't have to have double payments at the same time. That's that's honestly is a big improvement over the current process where you're sort of stuck with like oh yes this is the date in which you know ownership is transferring and that's just legacy. That's how the industry current operates. So this is an improvement. Also, you can close in, in as little as three days. That is wicked fast relative to the industry. Um, and this is, once again, you're working with one counterparty. You don't have to put it on the market. Uh, that's huge for a seller where you can go through the ups and downs of rejection. You know, you, you got all these buyers going through their house. Um, you know, some of them like it. Oh, they don't like this. They don't like that. Um, but the trade-off is that slightly more expensive fees where you can see, you know, the fees are around 5.5% versus 7% for open door. Um, Days on the market can be zero. It's up to you on the closing date, and the falls through are zero percent because once they commit, it happens. So this, they, it does seem like they're doing something special here in the residential real estate space. Um, do sellers even like it though? Like, it does it has the experience been favorable when sellers have sold? To open door, and this honestly surprised me. Their net promoter score is seventy. That's on par with the likes of like Apple brand or Tesla. That means people people that have interacted, customers who have interacted with Open Door loved it. Seventy means you're generally seventy percent are going to refer Open Door. It's a, like a favorable brand reference, and you can see that's better than some major brands like Netflix and Uber. So this is this means they're doing something special, in my opinion. What's the opportunity that Open Door is trying to tackle? And the opportunity is just ginormous because you know they frame it as look at just the U.S. What is what is the the total dollar value of the home sold each year? Well, that's like one point three trillion dollars. So if we get four percent of that, then we would be having fifty billion dollars in revenue. And currently, they they have a five billion approximate run rate as of the first quarter. So that would be ten x from here. So like holy smokes, this is huge potential. And that's only 4% market share. 
the reality is like, man, you're tapping into a huge market and um, we'll see. I, I get it. I, 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 I think I get the value proposition. Um, you know, it's funny looking at this map is that you can see St. Louis is marked as in Illinois and not Missouri. Some other people on Twitter have been like, yeah, a bunch of other you know, cities are off as well. So I guess attention to detail doesn't really matter when you're just talking about trillions and billions of dollars. Um, so strong data insights, you know, do, do they have a unrivaled value proposition? And if, if so, why? And strong data insights is, is one of the things that they are going to have, because if you're selling tens of thousands of homes, you're going to know like, oh yes, having this roof is going to be X value. Having these countertops is going to be this value. This number of bedrooms in this neighborhood will be worth this much. You will be able to get more, you know, have a better bid based on having more data. Um, and what they've noticed is that their cohorts, their acquisition cohorts of houses that they bought then sold, the deltas have been getting smaller over time, meaning they've been getting more and more accurate with what they've done. And the automation of this buying and selling houses has only continued to improve. So, you know, they're, they're getting so much more data on how to value individual components of homes that they are going to be a specialist buyer in the market because they're able to read, you know, see all this data and say, this is what it should be worth versus sort of the current way, which is like a broker saying, or a real estate agent saying like, oh yeah, this is, this is a good deal. You know, this is a complete stranger that otherwise you don't know telling you like, yeah, this home's a good deal and you're going to be buying, a, you know, it's a lot of money and you have no idea. And it's like, do you, do, do, how, how does a real estate agent possibly compare with, you know, a, a computer model that's like, yes, we studied 10,000 different homes and this is the value of these countertops, these granite countertops. Um, is, is there, you know, do they have an unrivaled value proposition? Um, you know, is there anything else that's contributing to an unrivaled value proposition? And, you know, they say that they have a cost advantage, you know, where because they're buying and, and selling these homes, um, they're, they're more efficient at buying and getting bulk discounts. You know, they have you know, literally 10,000 plus subcontractors on their platform because they're going to rely on these subcontractors like, oh, there's a problem with this roof. This is how much we know it can cost. We can get this discount because we're throwing away, you know, we're throwing this much business to these subcontractors. So you start, you know, whenever I hear platform, I start getting excited because it might mean there's some sort of virtuous aspect to a business that makes it harder for others to compete. And, you know, I'm talking about unrivaled value proposition. The reason why it's so important is because if you have an unrivaled value proposition, it gives you the right to win. And when you're buying homes, this is a, like a super competitive market. There are literally thousands of real estate agents out there. So you need to have something special if you're going to beat all the other home buyers and make a truly unrivaled value proposition for those home sellers. Um, and so they're saying, look, we, we can fix up homes at a discount because we have this platform of subcontractors and we have the data to know what's the right price to bid. But is it really an unrivaled value proposition? And honestly, I'm just not sure, you know, regardless of whether or not they do, you know, they, they are just buying houses in bulk. They're scaling ridiculously fast. You know, for example, in 2019, they were up 160% from a revenue perspective of the number of houses that they were able to sell. Um, and there, the number of homes sold in 2019 was more than 4x their nearest competitor. Um, so sure, there are multiples of their nearest competitor on a basis of homes sold, but they're not the only ones in the market. And that's the part that honestly concerns me. Um, because when I'm thinking about unrivaled value proposition, in order to dominate the market, you have a good or service that no one else offers, either on price or on quality. And so I'm just not so sure that these data points that they call it as unrivaled really will compete against other players that are trying to do the exact same thing. And, you know, for example, if you are unrivaled and you have other companies trying to buy homes like this and flip them, like what does your unrivaled value proposition really enable? Like, does it like the cost advantage, does that mean you can just pay more than others? And it does that put you in sort of a risky position that now you're going to be bidding more because you can know you could get more of a discount. Um, let's check out Redfin, for example. You know, if you see Redfin, Redfin's, you know, one of their new segments is trying to offer much of the same functionality and more. In the second quarter 2020, they had 300 million 
annualized in property revenue. And this is the same sort of thing, buying homes and selling them, um, you know, same sort of cost, 7% cost. Um, and they were growing 80% versus open door, which is forecast to decline nearly 50% um, in 2020. The reason why there's this huge delta, you know, between the 80% growth versus the, the huge decline um, for, for open door is open door pretty much froze everything once COVID started. And it's like, we don't know what's going to happen. Let's, let's wait and see. And so that's honestly, that's probably part of the reason why they need to do this back is like, Hey, we need to get this capital in because we're, we were trying to grow super fast. Now we're, we slammed on the brakes, which is obviously going to impact revenue because if you slam on the brakes from buying houses, you're not going to have that inventory to sell later on. So that's the reason why the revenue is declining. Um, but that should, you know, their, their, their projections, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is for that to get, you know, to go right back up for them to start growing super fast. But here's an example of what Redfin's offering. You know, you, they have their traditional Redfin, you know, assistance where it, it's cheaper to list on Redfin versus a traditional selling agent where it's 1% versus 3%. But they're offering all these additional services to try to compete and offer things that are better than this. They have Redfin Concierge where they'll they'll have a 2.5% listing fee for them to fix up the home and then sell it for you. Or there's Redfin Now, which is pretty much identical to what, what they're talking about here. They have Redfin Direct Offers, which competes directly with what they're saying, where um, you can have buyers... Um, just bid without actually going um, through an agent. Uh, you know, there's, in my mind, this doesn't strike me as unrivaled when you can see other players, other real players. And keep in mind, Redfin has much more downloads in terms of an app than Open Door. Um, so I, I, I'm just not so sure about this. Like, for example, when I looked at Redfin, the stock, and you can check out my video, and I did a, did a Redfin video just a few days ago. Um, you know, the part about Redfin, the business model that I like was actually their brokerage side, where they're enabling these thousands of brokers. Trying to disrupt the industry by buying houses, it's, it's a very asset-intensive side, low return on invested capital, um, but just, you know, you try to do it at scale and leverage, and hey, you know, it's easy to confuse uh, genius for leverage, or excuse me, leverage for genius. Um, so what about, you know, IPOB, Open Doors, financials? And you can see, like, look, they've grown ridiculously fast over a few years. You're having that COVID hit in 2020. But then they're hoping to be 40, nearly 40,000 homes sold, 10 billion in sales um, by 2023. You know, they're, they're looking to have dramatic growth. But this is where it's, you know, this is, this is the, the, the gross profit margin, you know, the 7% now that's tied to the 7% cut that they're currently getting. Um, you know, then, you know, their, their goal is if you have, you know, additional services like title insurance, like mortgage loan origination, things like that, um, you know, you could start increasing your gross margin. But the reality is, you know, even their EBITDA margins, and they, they talk about long-term potential, you know, you're talking about mid-single digits at best. This is a razor-thin operating margin business. And, you know, one legitimate question I have is, will this business model work in all interest rate environments? You know, we, we're sort of biased that for the last few decades, rates have gone lower and lower and lower. Um, you know, that's not always the case. Interest rates do have cycles. Um, what's what's the hole in this business model? You know, is is there a like key risk to this business model? And as long as rates are low, this model can sustain. And l look, for example, you know they're they they've gotten some nice terms. You know, you can see that their their financing you know has gone from eighty percent down, ninety percent, one hundred. So they're they're effectively getting a hundred percent of their financing for their houses now, and their cost of borrowing has steadily dropped from LIBOR plus six fifty to LIBOR plus two fifty. So it's getting more and more affordable. Um, you know, you, the the cash, their balance sheet's now much so much better, and so they needed that cash. You know, like if you want to pursue this this capital intensive business model, you want the cash. So that's why SPAC, you know, IPOB cash is going into the balance sheet. But you know, my concern is like, what happens at ten percent inflation? Um, yeah, of course that sounds like absolutely kooky dukes, but you know what? It could happen, and I don't like business models where it's like, yeah, um, something that's not crazy out of the norms. Um, can blow up that business model. Like I, I, I want something that's robust or anti-fragile when I'm investing. When there's a key, you know, stress point that can completely destroy a business model, then I'm like, mm, it's uh, too hard for me. Like it, at 10% inflation, 
you know, like, or even five, five to 10% inflation. What are they supposed to do? Just raise the, you know, increase their fees by five to 10%. Well, that's not going to work when you have the agents that are still charging 6%. So I, I just don't get it. Um, in a low interest rate environment, this business model works in a much higher interest rate environment. And I know, you know, right now everyone's thinks, you know, the federal reserve is going to hold rates low forever. And that's how we get out of this. But I also see deficits as far as the eyeball can see. Um, I, I'm, I think, uh, these things come in cycles. Maybe 10 years from now, inflation is much higher. Um, so what to do next? You know, this, the IPOB stock is like popped from $10 a share to 17 because the deal has been announced and there's details. Um, you know, is, is this a great bargain opportunity? And what's next is Chamath just keeps going on. He's a machine, man. Like he's like, oh, time to go on to the fourth SPAC, um, you know, raising raising $500 million. This is the same day that the, the news came out that Open Door, you know, that they're merging with Open Door. So it's like, you know, Keep the machine going, you know. As long as long as we have a good thing going on, and you're able to get some, you know, reasonable fees from this. Let's let's keep going. Um, I'm not saying that Chamath is doing this for the fees. That's actually not the case at all. He's he's definitely investing a lot of the capital in this. But uh, you know, as long as you have a machine where you're able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars, why not? Um, but from my perspective, this is just too hard for me right now. You know, what's what's the right price for a business model that could potentially blow up in in ten percent inflation? I I don't know. It's it's or ten percent interest rates. This is this strikes me as as super tough. Um, you know, what's the right price? And you know, I I'm I'm doing a back of the envelope here of what's the right price. And this is my value proposition to you. Or if you go in the description of this video, you can click on a link. That'll open this sheet up, so that way you can play around with your own assumptions. You know, technically the stock price is a little higher than seventeen. This, the 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 shares outstanding. That's a different figure than what you'll see in the historic, you know, SPAC ten K filings because they're they've merged they're merging with Open Door. So you need to use the pro forma shares outstanding. So their you know their valuation is ten ten eleven billion dollars. Um, and you can see what I'm penciling out, 2020 sales of somewhere between $2.3 and $2.8 billion. That's based on the decline that they, they've penciled out because of COVID. Um, and here I'm, you know, I'm saying optimized net operating margins of somewhere between 2 and 4%. These, these are razor thin, and it's hard for me to pencil this out, especially when I don't know what interest rates are going to be you know, a few years from now. Right now, they're unprofitable pretty significantly. Um, you know, but but maybe that this is some sort of optimized margin in the future. You know, you can slap on some sort of tax rate of twenty five percent. You know, slap some sort of growth rate in in the next five years because every investment I always try to take a multi year perspective. I'm not looking to day trade or anything like that. I'm taking a long term perspective with every company I want to look at. You know, throw. You know, this is a pretty pretty nice growth rate somewhere between forty and fifty percent. So that's saying in five years from now their revenue is gone up nearly 8x, so that would be great. Um, you can see the implied operating profits, the implied net profits, slapping on an assumed multiple of 20, 30 times. I don't know what's the right multiple to slap on for something where it's like, do you really have some sort of special thing? I mean, it is, I guess, special to be able to buy that many homes and sell that many homes, but I just don't see why you would pay more than that in five years from now. And based on that, the, the risk reward profile for like five years out, it's pretty awful. Like in, in, in five years from now, the, the people that are currently buying IPOB could easily see their share price lower five years from now. You know, so I, I'm penciling out upside downside of effectively one to one. So I'm, I'm not really interested in IPOB. I don't, I don't see how their business model is resilient in throughout all interest rate cycles. Maybe I'm just missing something there. Um, and I also don't see why it's unrivaled versus every, you know, these other competitors like Redfin that are trying to do the same thing and are certainly open to exploring other ways to disrupt the space. I mean, I, I did a whole other video on Redfin where they're they're being very creative about a lot of different, you know, value offerings and they are growing quickly. You know, Redfin's growing 80% this year in their property segment. Um, their, their other segment has historically, you know, their brokerage segments historically grown at 20% a year. So while I'm not buying IPOB or open door, if you do want to see what I'm buying and selling, what I'm holding each month and why go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey. I also put out exclusive videos talking about investment commentary, commentary, things that I think are interesting as well as a little more detail. And um, your support enables the production of these unrivaled in investing educational videos. And if you enjoyed this video, 
please make sure you hit that thumbs up and also subscribe. Thanks.